I don't have the same connection to you that you have with Kevin Smith, but I lost my virginity to a guy who looked like Silent Bob. So, you know, like, I have some tie to this conversation. I have some investment. But first, a word from our sponsors. Overnight, Dunkin's Pumpkin Spice Coffee has sent folks into a cozy craze. I'm Lauren LaTulip reporting live from home in my hand-knit turtleneck that my Nana made me. Mmm, cinnamony. The home with Dunkin' is where you want to be. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Upgrade your business with Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. Shop pay boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning fewer carts going abandoned and more sales going cha-ching. So if you're into growing your business, get a commerce platform that's ready to sell wherever your customers are. Visit Shopify.com to upgrade your selling today. Welcome to the Man or Podcast. Shout out to the angry clerks, to the dirty mall rats, to the strike backers and the Amy chasers. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Colon, and dot over the dot, followed by sex positive conversations. Yes, welcome to the show. If you're new, welcome back. If you're not, this week is part two. Part two. With YouTuber and media critic Princess Weeks. By the way, do forgive uh, if you if I don't know if you can hear this, but it, they're, they're building an entirely new building right behind my bedroom door, and so you know I got to keep my voice down. I, I don't want to make any of the the boys out there uncomfortable if I bring up rim jobs. Last week's episode with Princess, uh, I talked a whole lot about her, her relationships, uh, her experience in polyamory, the shift to monogamy being in an interracial relationship, dating intentionally. And and this episode, this episode was supposed to be a bonus episode. Because again, I, I found Princess Weeks via a documentary I went to the screening of, the, the world debut of, uh, Chasing Chasing Amy, which you will learn more about in time. She's in the movie, and I met her at the after party, and and then like we we talked a bit and, and then we finally got her on. Great. So this bonus episode was going to be about my favorite movie, Chasing Amy. But but we just it was this was not tight. We could not limit our thoughts, our feelings, our opinions on Chasing Amy and old movies that we want to enjoy in a present context. Couldn't couldn't keep it tight to a tight 10, 15 minutes. It was so good. It went so long that I felt like, God, I feel bad putting this behind the paywall. So here it is, part two, where we talk a lot about Chasing Amy, Kevin Smith movies, and then there's just basically this dialogue of art from the past holding up to present uh, standards and how we enjoy or engage with that kind of media. You're going to hear that sh- shortly. First, I got to tell you that New Yorkers... The Naked Comedy Show, it's back. It is coming back for a two-year celebration on September 26th at the Hacienda. We've got 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock shows, and tickets are now finally on sale. Uh, You'll see a link at the top of the schnotes. If you're on the email blast, you may want to go check that. There's a discount code in there for you. Again, ticket link at the top of the schnotes or at manwhorepod.com where you can find all of my upcoming stand-up comedy dates. Before I get to my guest this week, Princess Weeks, let's do a quick fan horror appreciation moment. I want to say thank you to Mona for being a member of Fan Horror Nation on the Patreon. Check your email. I have a weird question I had to ask you, but that that's between you and me and everyone who's listening to me ask you, son, about that's between you and me. Thank you for supporting the podcast. I hope you're enjoying all the bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and more. You too can become a member today at patreon.com slash Podcast. If you have an iPhone, you should join on desktop or a mobile browser to avoid the uh, 30% fee from Apple, I am told to say. Chasing Amy is near and dear to my heart, and luckily I don't think anyone... Sirius says that like chasing Amy's just fucking unwatchable today. 
The only people who say Chasing Amy is unwatchable are the people who think that all of Kevin Smith's movies are unwatchable, and those people are not invited to anything that I go to. I don't even think I would call Chasing Amy outdated as much of it's of its time. If anything, it's progressive for its time, 1997. So when I went to go see Chasing Chasing Amy, there are quite a few queer media critics who have words. And that was one of the things I reacted to when watching Princess in in the dock was like being kind of tough on my man, Kevin. So I was very excited that we got to have this conversation about Chasing Amy and about Kevin. So uh, again, folks, I am delighted to share with you a part two of my conversation with Princess Weeks. Enjoy ad-free episodes at patreon.com slash podcast. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Upgrade your business with Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. Shop pay boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning fewer carts going abandoned and more sales going cha-ching. So if you're into growing your business, get a commerce platform that's ready to sell wherever your customers are. Visit shopify.com to upgrade your selling today. Remember when I was all like, oh, you can disagree if you want to. It was like, this is probably where it will happen. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I watched, because, you know, I went to that, uh, I went to the screening at Tribeca mm-hmm. uh, the night we met. Yeah. And, you know, you're you're in the movie. Yeah. In a good amount. And there was a few times. I'm in I the poster. There, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I said, but a few times where you pop up on the screen, I go like, you're being a little hard on my man, Kevin, right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into it. Because I do. I actually love Kevin Smith. He's one of my favorite directors. Ditto. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's my guy. I yeah. feel like he's... Actually, there's a... I'm about to start my, like, I guess my research. The, the video essay thing, I've only learned was a thing yeah. on my LA trip. Because LA lady, yeah. she was showing me, like, your video essays and ContraPoints. Yeah. When I was like, oh, wait. People are doing what? Yeah. Great. That looks like so much work. A three hour video. Yeah. Ooh. Natalie is, Natalie is, the, are you, re- is this recording? No, we're okay. on. Oh, yeah. We're Natalie on. is like one of the greatest of all time. Natalie, um, Ab- Abigail Thorne, who does, um, Philosophy Tube, um, my mentor and really good friend, Lindsay Ellis, who's like one of the people that considered like creating that format as it is on YouTube. It's, it's a lot of work, but I also love it. I love doing research. Like, I, I got my master's in English. So, like, I actually do too much research and then I'm like, I gotta do the rest of it. But it's one of my favorite things. But yeah, I, you know, the thing about it is like, so how I met Sav was I wrote a piece Sav's about the director, the, everybody for, for chasing, chasing Amy. I wrote an article about chasing Amy for the Mary Sue, which is where I used to work about how much I love it, but as a bisexual movie versus a, a lesbian film. And I, I love it. Like I love clerks. I try to suck any dick on the way to the parking lot. Yeah. Get, I, I, I really love his work. I had a friend in college who made me a t-shirt that says like, what is it? Like food can't be racist from clerks to line. Like I, I really, I really enjoy well, for, it. With the clerks too. Yeah. From like, baby, you can't taste racism. You can't taste racism. Yeah. That was, that was. <clears throat> I have to show my girl clerks too because I, I kept trying to explain that scene to her. I was like, you know what? I'd rather just show you it than yeah. say that. Over it's better, it, it's better let, it, let it let it wash over you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I really I cri- the thing about it too. Like I also critique everything I love. Mm-hmm. So I always have to remind people that like I will critique something really extremely, but I'll be like, this is my favorite thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. So like I would love to hear what you disagree with me about on chasing Amy. Mm-hmm. Like just <clears throat> well, I haven't seen. It's I, been so long since I I remember what the cool things I said were. So. I need to re see it, but I was so excited uh, that it got picked up. Yeah, you know, that's it's so I it doesn't have a date yet. I don't, I don't think, I don't think but it has a date. Yet. It has a distributor. Like yeah. we're gonna see it in theater. Like that's gonna be sick. I know. I'm gonna. I don't think my my boyfriend and my mom both haven't seen it yet, and my brother hasn't seen it. So I think I might just be like, hey, you all want to come see me be in the movie? It's, it's the second queer doc I've done. And I'm just what like, was I just, first? it was um, it's, it was called Queering the Script. It was done by these two amazing uh, lesbian directors. And it was kind of like about like Clexicon and like kind of like the barrier gaze. Um, barrier gaze? Ba- barrier gaze was like a trope about like killing off gay characters. Barry as in like, you know, Barry. Um, Barry as in, wait. As in, like, bury them, put them in the ground. Oh, oh. bury. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. And that was the third bury I thought of. First, I thought you said barrier gaze. Yeah. I was like, like, we're we lining the border with them? Is that, yeah. 
Is that the new plan? That's Kamala's plan. It's like, well, no, we're going to put gays on the border. Yeah. And that's going to fix. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, well. And then I thought you meant berries. Like the food is like, okay, that's kind of a gay fruit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes you're sense. Like, no, like, put them in the ground. I'm like, oh, yeah. that got dark. Yeah. It was a trope about like um, killing off sure. gay characters in movies and talking about that experience. And like, mm-hmm. so I was one of the people that was in it. Uh-huh. And I talked about like, you know, the race, gender intersections, of course. And like. I get called, it's like I'm black or something. People ask me, like, what do you think about race? And I'm like, well, you got 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, Kevin, and and so I actually wanted, I'm going to do an episode of the pod, a so, solo episodes, very scary for me. I don't know how you do that uh, for every time. Uh, I can't <laughs> talk without, I need you here because I just need to know if what I said was dumb. Uh, you know, it's like I need that right. feedback. But I have, I'm really dedicated to, I want to do this episode where I will, it's going to be like Kevin Smith's sex ed. Like <laughs> everything I learned about sex and relationships and gender Ooh, yeah. through probably clerks to clerks too, I think would be the stretch because I learned so much. I watched it like Sav when I was watching mm-hmm. chasing, chasing Amy in the beginning of this doc is how this like young trans guy was like watching chasing Amy on VHS over and over and over again. Yeah. And I also would fall asleep from the age of like 14 to like, I don't know, 26. Mm-hmm. I would just go to sleep to clerks and mall rats and chasing Amy yeah. all, and do- all those all the time. And so I learned um, as a young kid who didn't have a lot of friends, bullied a lot, didn't have confidence talking to girls. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my introduction. My introduction to queerness, I think, was chasing Amy. Oh, that's so cool. Like, understanding, like, men being insecure and dumb about sex Mm -hmm. clerks. Yeah. Like, I understood when I was, like, 12 and 13 that, like, Dante's being weird about her sex life. Yeah. And so, like, so there's a lot of that. And I think each movie, like, taught me Goodbye, (laughs) Dante. So, so I, so Kevin, like, I think is one of the three people to like heavily influence me as, yeah. you know, as a young kid. And I don't know, I've watched a lot of those. I've probably seen Chasing Amy with the DVD commentary yeah, almost as many times of, as I've watched Chasing Amy. So yeah. I've also, I, I feel like I'm go. I don't know. Sometimes people hate and I go like, you're a scholar, you're a Chasing Amy scholar. And I respect that. I think for me, you know, I, I watched Chasing Amy when I was already like in my queerness. I, for the most part, uh. I remember the, the, dvd store by my college was going out of business and you could like buy some of the dvds there so i got chasing amy Rebogenetic opera and mall rats um but my my go-to was always dogma that was my go-to which Kevin now Smith. is like you can't thanks to Lionsgate, it's hard to get a hold i know of that i have i literally have that, that that old dvd that i i cling to because that was my because I went to Catholic school growing up. So, like, that to me had, like, how that he had picked someone who worked for Planned Parenthood to be, like, the descendant of Jesus. I was like, abortion. I was like, my introduction ab- to abortion. abortion. Yeah, it's just, dogma. It was such a really well done film about, like, religion. And I think with Chasing Amy, I think that I always, I always call, like, the, like, the accidental, like, queer feminism of that movie. And I don't say that in, like, a negative way. I think that the language that was available at the time leaned in a way that makes it feel especially i i I would think for lesbians to a degree erasure because bisexual wasn't really the talking point of the time but when you have that language now you see so much of like the the female bi experience in what's happening on the screen the insecurity of it the alienation from certain spaces when they think that you've left them for men and and also like the insecurity about like oh you've had sex with men and women and and all those kind of things and like i think for me as well i see it so much through her point of view versus like his that like to a certain degree you need him to get like all the access into it and like figure out all these different kind of things and i think the conclusion of it is so satisfying because of how good of a storyteller it is. There are just little things that are just dated because of when it was made. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think it's a part of how you contextualize why certain queer people did not like it at the time. Because in the context of when it was made, it was a little like, not reductive, but like limiting to say that she needed like the idea like, oh, she got good dick and then she wasn't Okay, but, but, okay, but that, see, that's... See, because 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 she identified as a lesbian explicitly versus queer or bisexual. Okay, but the whole point, and and this is from I think I picked this up on like remember he did those an evening with Kevin Smith yeah. things. Okay, but again, all the things that Banky says, 
Mm -hmm. Like, are basically whenever I hear somebody quote problematic lines from Chasing Amy, I think almost exclusively they're quoting lines from Banky. And Kevin's been very clear. Banky's the idiot character. That's why he says it. It it, it negates what he says because he's the idiot. So that's why those words come out of his mouth as opposed to say Holden or somebody else, right? So when they say like, oh, well, you just need a good dick. No, but that's, you know, the movie's never saying that because he put, Banky's the guy saying it. I don't even think of it as his words. I think of it as, their sex mm-hmm. being this thing that like shifts how okay. she's viewing it because i don't think his words are what matter i think that what you see on screen because of how she labels herself sure. and that's why the labels label conversations are complicated mm. because if you say you're a lesbian that means something right. especially in the context of when that movie was made so that when she sleeps with a man even though like that's not what the movie might inherently be saying that is what you're seeing mm-hmm. and i think e- you can take Kevin Smith in good faith retroactively, but I think that at the time, I don't know if people knew that nuance was what he was putting into the film. Sure. And I don't think that's an indictment on the film. I think it's just a conversation that's worth having when you're talking about the queer relationship to that movie, because that's a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that as it's gotten, as it's evolved, as time has gone on, it's aged better because of that. Because now we have the language and most people would look at it and just assume bisexuality and her having comp het, haha, reference. And the women that are, the lesbian characters that are rejecting her are responding to this idea of her being in like a comp het situation of like, oh, we're like, we're using us as your community layaway mm. before you were with a man. And I think those are just interesting. It, it sets up all these different kind of things about love, identity. And I think about the line where she goes, you know, I didn't limit myself in terms of how I wanted to be loved. That's why I ended up being, you know, for lack of a word, queer. And I relate to that so much. And that's why when you were asking me prior to the episode about, like, do I think I will miss, you know, pussy now that I'm in a cishet relationship? It's like, no, because, like, I was already open to the possibility that I could love and be in a long-term relationship with anybody of any mm-hmm. genitalia, of any background. And so that just means I just landed here versus like, this was my choice over everything else. I'm able to have, I feel like, I feel, I get very defensive of, this is my favorite movie. Yeah, it's fine. And it's like, I feel like I get very defensive over it, particularly if it's like, like quote unquote young people, and we're young people, so younger people, mm-hmm. like a Gen Z, I feel like I'll get defensive at them because the way they like because they just discovered it because i think they miss context of like Mm -hmm. the making of the movie like the time period because they weren't fucking alive during it uh they don't remember what media was back then they don't know kevin has a gay brother and wrote it because his brother was complaining he never got to see himself on a screen i when people go all out attack on chasing amy i get really defensive like do you even know what the fuck you're talking about like you're 12 like what are you doing um, as opposed to you, it's like, you know, but also I think when I saw you on screen initially, I assumed you were younger. And so I think I got a little tight in the theater, uh, before. Like, who's, got- who's this youth? <laughs> who's this youth talking about my favorite movie? And yes. I'm all- surprised I'm only two years younger than you. Take that. <laughs> um, three, either way, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But I think I totally get the protectiveness and I'm protective of that movie as well. I think if someone was meaner to it than I am, I'd be like, I don't think you understood the point of it. Mm. You know, and I've defended Tropic Thunder quite a bit. I also, I think that it's possible to defend a movie that you know is good, that you know very deeply inside and out, while also understanding that not everyone wants to do that kind of work to understand a film. Sure. And that people are entitled to their wrong opinion. You know, like I, it's hard, but you know, Sometimes it has to it has to happen. <laughs> and I think the thing about Sav's movie is that through him, you get this explosion of new discourse. Because the thing about it, too, a lot of his fan base, Kevin Smith, are white men. And it doesn't behoove you <laughs> <laughs> to then be like, look at these these young they them gays and they're <laughs> and in these bipoc gays talking about my favorite movie not you but yeah. like you know the energy again, of like, a- listening to like a 45 year old queer woman talk about chasing amy versus a 20 year old queer woman talking about chasing Amy. like i'm i'm receiving whether it, that's it, right or wrong i received those criticisms it's just so different yeah well it's like r- just recently there's an article about like gen z or like are discovering sex in the city for the first time and they have bad takes i'm like having bad sex in the city takes is a part of life you know like <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to go through the 
is Carrie a bad guy? You know, you have to go through yeah. all of that. It's like, yes, yes. And and along the way, you will find articles and cited sources that tell you that you that you should have known this for all along. And I think that part of the nature of like the new internet is that everyone has an opinion in a very egalitarian way and you lose the difference. And this kind of sounds kind of elitist. I don't mean it to be between like critics who are really well versed in a topic versus lay people who have built an audience just talking about how they, how they feel and not doing any research. Like I always talk about for me, whenever I entered a fandom, I did a lot of research about what the fandom was into. Like when I watched Star Trek for the first time, I did a lot of research about like, okay, who are the most popular characters in Star Trek? What are the ships? Who are the people that people like? Where are the hot? So I wanted to know about it so that when I talked to people, I'd be like, so what do you think about this and this and this? I remember when I got into Doctor Who, I like was on message boards reading everything about, okay, people don't like this companion, people like this companion, but I like that. Uh, not everyone does that sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and so i had to always remind myself that like just because you would sit down and read the wiki of ice and fire for <laughs> 10 hours straight <laughs> does not mean everyone has done that yeah it does mean you're better than them but it doesn't mean that you have to act that that's right. way <laughs> that's right i wonder if i don't know i'm just kind of having this thought now so like i grew up like a chubby white boy from new jersey and then like kevin and i would see kevin grew up to like have the career that he's having and also like he married this like beautiful woman who like yeah. literally posed for playboy and uh and he got to shoot it which i think is really sweet uh before you share your nudes with the entire world like you got to shoot them oh, that's nice and i wonder if i'm some of the defensiveness is is not simply the movie but kevin i think i tell me if you disagree uh i think we can accept him in good faith for like the things he's made, the things he says afterwards, he will say that certain things in certain movies don't completely hold up now. Mm -hmm. He's He seems like a guy who's open to hearing that. He seems like forward-minded and all that jazz, right? And so I wonder if there's an element of me looking like this, thinking, am I being defensive because he's a like a straight white guy trying to do well? Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm trying to defend even that concept when people go too hard at him for these movies he made in the 90s that were forward for the time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if I'm just like maybe defending the concept of like, hey, look, he's just he's a he's a white he's guy. A nice who means guy. Well. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. trying. He's he's your he's your your Avi. You know, he's your tether. You really care about, you know, I think that's how I feel about shows like Buffy, the Joss Whedon of it aside. And like charmed. I'm like, these shows are really good for the time. These were really, in you know, I think that those things matter. I, you know, I don't have the same connection to you that you have with Kevin Smith, but I lost my virginity to a guy who looked like Silent Bob. So, you know, like I have some tie to this conversation. I have some investment. And I just think that like the thing that really warmed me to him more than anything was like hearing him talk about other things. He's so smart. And he usually said about Buffy, very articulate, very well spoken. And I think that because of the like the boy frat boy's reputation, and also the fact that he was not taken as seriously as a director mm -hmm. for a long time, leads people to come into his movies with an idea of who he is before. Because yeah. I think that you know he gets compared to like Tarantino, and like because they came up around the same time in terms of, like them being indie uh. directors. When I was discovering, when I was discovering film, and I was hearing about Kevin Smith, I would hear him being brought up in conversation with Tarantino as people who both do a lot of references, mm -hmm. both really like old movies, both start off as indie directors, and how they both are like went in very different directors in terms of how they were treated by respectability and like what they chose to do the movies about and things like that sorry they also went in very different directions of like how often they use the n-word uh yeah 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 and we're, we're and we're thankful for that uh very <laughs> thankful for for that as well I think, um, I think there's one in the entire viewers universe yes and and we and we want to keep it that way <laughs> We love you, Kevin. Let us let us keep loving you. I've run into him so many times at Comic Con, and I never talked to him because I'm always just like, hey, I gotta go. I, like, oh, I'll, you ran to him? Ra I've ran into like I've oh, into, I've, I've okay. been in the back of of New York Comic Con. And I I'll thought see you said rant to him. No, 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 no. no. You're like, I don't talk to him. I ran. I'm afraid I would be so I'd be so intimidated to speak to him. Um, but I remember like at New York Comic Con when I would be doing press and I would be behind and I would see him walking with like a hockey jersey and I'm like, he has somewhere important to be. I have to leave, just go away. But in my heart, I'd be like, I love you. I love your work. Um, 
And I think that because of the reputation of his fandom, the way that critics talk about his work, I think it was very easy. I think it's very easy if you're a young person coming into his work to not know the depth that he puts into it, to not know how thoughtful he really is. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you see the wholeness of Kevin Smith, it makes his work stand out even better. Like, I think they're all good. But when you know more about him, you're like, oh, he's really thoughtful. You just wouldn't know that necessarily off the top. Because I think at a certain point now, you can't separate how how you're you're treating Eamon as from the wholeness of what you know about it now. You've seen it so many times in so many different ways. I've seen him talk about it on these different DVDs. I've heard the commentary. So it's like... I have all this backstory stuff too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's so, take that so, away. so it's all in you. Whereas someone else, like they just don't have all that information. And I think just know that they're not as wise as you. And doesn't that suck for them? <laughs> Question. If Chasing Amy is the exact same movie, exact same time period, nothing, literally nothing. Cha- maybe one character's something has changed. Mm-hmm. It's basically the same movie. Instead, it's directed by a queer woman. Mm-hmm. Do you think the re- the commentary, the reactions would be different? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think a queer woman would make the same movie. Not to, not to, no, no, not but to, let's just say but, yeah, same I, exact I, movie, I, but it was a queer woman director. Because hmm. I do think there's a low element. Of I mean, I mean, it, this man w- made this would movie. there be more grace? I think so. Okay. I think at, at best, maybe would have more of a but I'm a cheerleader reputation. Mm-hmm. Um. But I. But I think that. Even while saying that, I just think, and again, this is not to like throw your question out. I just, I just, I don't think they could be the same movie. Mm-hmm. I think that there is just, especially if we're talking about someone in the same breath. If you think, of, if you look at the queer movies that women of that age were making, mm-hmm. it's just very different. And I don't really know, and you know, that that comes up in the documentary of uh, what, there was another movie same year, right? That that uh, Sav kind of juxtaposes chasing amy with i forget what it was it too. but maybe it was a fish called walnut no that's not did i just make that up would it be i think so bound it could have been bound but that's the wachowskis it was it was one where it was like a you know queer women made it and it got uh i think some of the people involved in that their whole thing was like it felt like this guy made this queer movie mm. the straight man made a queer movie and it's getting more attention than a queer people who act who made this queer movie over here mm-hmm. um so I know that that was at play. That, but like, so what are other movies of the time period that were like queer made that you might recommend well, someone to check out? Well, I think you know, I obviously I say Watermelon Woman. I would say, but I'm a cheerleader. Um, Bound, um, which is always good. I think everything the Wachowskis make is queer, and it also makes so much sense why Jupiter Ascending is so boring at a certain point because they do not understand heterosexual relationships. <laughs> They're too gay to function. Because I'm like, I'm like, are both of them trans or what? both I, of them are trans? Oh, women. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I miss, now, I miss now, the second coming out. Yeah. Now, now I think now their stuff has been changed against the Wachowski sisters. Um, for uh, which I think is just really cool. Do you feel like one of them was? I forget. I, I think Lana maybe came out first, but do you think one like went to the other? Be like, if as soon as you you get out there, we can change the title cards to sisters. We can get out there. I don't know. I I feel like there. I feel like that is to me. I think of that, and I'm just like, I wonder how many. I I think it's just so cool. Like that, the Matrix is such a gay ass movie. And so many dude bros think it's about them. I it took me so long to watch The Matrix, and when I finally did, I was like, "This is the movie that like white red pill dudes think is like for them." Like they think it's a like it's a movie about like coming out, like yeah. like realizing you're queer or trans or something like. No, what, the, ma- what the would you say the guy the guys the guy fans who like The Matrix. Well, they, they think it's about like oh, this is why I should question like why vaccines work. Yeah, 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 but exactly. Saying, like, for the Wachowskis, it's such a like queer movie about like breaking the egg like you know like that's a metaphor i know a lot of trans people use about like they're an egg okay like they're about to like crack into this new form and i think that the matrix is all about that of like shedding one skin becoming something else becoming part of something bigger than yourself and like seeing beyond and i'm like it's so fun that they were able to make something like that inventive and that curious and I think like to to your previous joke, I think it's just their their support of each other, I think is Mm. also so fascinating to see two people who have gone through so much in the public eye and still manage to make really interesting like sex um sensate. 
to make so oh, much I like to Sense8. make so much like curious. I was sad that didn't keep yeah, going. it was just like so fascinating and like best orgy scene I think I've ever seen on. It TV. was yeah, yeah, like really good orgies. And I think Kevin Smith is the thing that I really love about him is that how he supports indie artists, how he supports so many different kinds of way that he that he did episodes of the flash and supergirl which is like in some really good episodes of, of television and and it, and his love for degrassi and mm. and you know when when shannon doherty who i also love just passed away like talking about the relationship with the her and supporting all these people and i think that i think one of the best things that you can say about a, a white male director is when you learn more about them and you're like he's a really good person so there's a moment in i, I don't want to give away like the what but i will say that sav got something i've got goosebumps again i i like cried like i was tearing like i cried multiple times during the screening i was with my friend pauline who's a comedian from staten island and i felt like oh she's gonna think i'm such a bitch right now um because i i multiple i got emotional multiple times in this movie especially when he gets this interview out of joey lauren adams that clearly no one has fucking ever gotten out of her right mm -hmm. And so I fell all sorts of way during that. And were you at the Tribeca screening? I was at part of it. I was like, I were was, you at the Q and A after? Or no? I wasn't at the Q and A. Okay, the there was um, the brief Q and A, but like I got to ask a question. Like yeah. the question I asked was like, how? Because Kevin was very clearly involved. He's in the movie. Yeah. Very friendly. He's supportive of the movie. And I asked, how did he feel when he first saw the footage yeah. of Joey sharing what she shared? And he said like that Kevin was you know responsive and like understanding and like all the things you would want his reaction to be yeah and then i was like oh thank god right oh good he's a he's a decent guy yeah i think that's one of the things that like i think it's so wild to see a director be this open and 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 forthright about a critique of his own of, of, of what people consider to be his best movie mm -hmm. you know like there, not a lot of people do that and i think that the openness to that has shown that he's been having this conversation much longer than it, either of us have been having and i think from even the beginning he has tried i think he and he's learned to really lead with the understanding that like this is a really close thing to a lot of people and people wouldn't care this much if it didn't connect to something really true yeah. and i think moving with that kind of compassion is like why i'm like i watch everything that he puts out you know, like I'm, I'm really like. Except cop out, I won't do it. Yeah, that. Well, everyone hate. Well, even he doesn't like that movie. He doesn't like it. Yeah, so it's like, well, we'll, we'll cop out, cop out. But I think, yeah, it's. I think it's a testament to the the humanity that he puts into his stuff. Like, and that's why I love Clerk so much. Like, just the just the entire way how it ends of like you have these this guy who's like mad at his girlfriend sucks dick when he's literally contemplating cheating on her, and then. He comes in as a voice of reason being like, you know, not a lot of women will come and like make lasagna for you and do stuff. And like, and ain't that the fucking truth? Most of them just cheat on you. Yeah. You know, that was supposed to be Jay's line, but he kept fucking it up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, that's, that's why Silent Bob was never going to speak. Yeah. But then he was, Jay couldn't get the fucking words out. And he's like, fuck it. I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do the line. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and every time he does one thing, it's, it's great. You know, and I, yeah. Yeah. What um you know in and in shooting chasing chasing Amy was there did you go into that with like a very specific thing you really wanted to to share? I was just really nervous because yeah. it was like I was like I came right from work. Sav was so fun and like we had made it happen and I just you know I was just so humbled and then it took so long for it to come out after it because you know I was like much younger yeah, and he started and, shooting it like pre COVID. Yeah, right? yeah 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 and so like it was just surreal to be able to talk about this movie and like share things and like hear people's positive response to what i was saying you know when you're brought in to be a talking head you want to make sure that you're saying something constructive and thoughtful and i guess anger the the fa the deeper fans was not with my intent but i i was just really honored because i think as someone who doesn't you know deals with a lot of insecurity when people read my work and respond to my work and 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 reach out to me and say that they really like what i do i'm like that's crazy. Thank you. You know, and I, so to me, it's always a very humbling experience. And all I want to do is, especially for someone who's investing so much time in their own money, I'm like, I want to give you the best of what I can bring to this conversation so that this wasn't a waste of your time. So I'm just like, so to me, it was always like, I just want to be good. Fair. And I know that the answer to this question, you'd be like, oh, there's two, there's so many things. But if you had to pick one thing, uh, I'm going to say if you had to pick one thing, if it was still being made back, in 96 97 what's one thing 
whether it's if a queer woman was directing it or if you were directing it at however old, right? Um, mm-hmm. What's one thing you would change? Hmm. Wow. That's a really good question. I think I would give Alicia like one really good friend who does stick with her through the whole thing. Like, I think I would have liked to just have her to have like one other friend who was like, have you thought about being bisexual? You know, I, I wish she had like, because it feels like her community is just kind of gone. And I would have liked for her to have had some more of that, to yeah. have like more of that, that, that conversation happening. We don't really have scenes of her without, you know, holding or holding her bank. We don't really have any scenes with her in that context except for when all of her friends drop her. Exactly. That's so the I w- only scene, I think, where they're not that there. I, Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. And I'm like, so I would like her to have more scenes of someone being like, so you're still seeing that guy, huh? And how's that going? And like having someone to talk to about that experience so that it's not just that one negative of like, you betrayed us, goodbye forever. Goodbye forever. I would have liked it to be like, you're working through this, we're friends, we're still a community, like, Let's talk about this. Because Even I, if it was one or two scenes with Hooper. Yeah. If Hooper's her, because they are friends. Exactly, yeah. If they, or even them together and them talking about like, or even him talking about like, oh, like, because I feel like gay men and bisexuality is another big topic as well. So it would have been nice to have them bounce back and forth about like, oh, yeah, I've had pussy before, you know, take it or leave it, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Like have there be more of queer, like the, the outwardly queer characters talking to each the other. The record store, you could take out that scene mm-hmm. where he's got a, Tell Holden, like, oh, well, straight guys think they're the Marco Polo of sex. <laughs> you could take that out that whole scene and substitute it with that scene. Yeah. I think, and it all works real nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to think, is there anything else regarding uh, chasing, chasing Amy that you feel like you really want to share? Just that you know, if Sav hears this, I'm just so proud of him. You know, I I think it's just so cool. Like, especially because I feel like he was really at the forefront of like a lot of like that trans mass trans male storytelling in that way you know like that it came out was working on this before page boy came out so it's just like i'm just really proud of him and his wife is so cool (laughs) yeah his wife's like loki this like little like star in the movie yeah Yeah. like i remember everyone in the theater was like i fucking like her yeah Yeah, she's like everyone's personal khaleesi so like Mm. having a good wife is great all right um (laughs) let's say uh, i'll close with this what do you think is the most which do you think of the Kevin Smith movies is the most like sex positive, queer positive, and which one do you think is the least sex positive? Um, I would say I think the most sex positive I would say is either probably either Dogma or Chasing Amy. Interesting. Why Dogma? I just I just think it's a fun. I just think have, when you have abortion in the story, I I mainly think of it as sex positive because I think that abortion is a part of sex. For you know, and, and I think like normalizing that is so key. And like, it's nice to have a movie that talks about sex that's not just about the act itself, but about like, yeah, <laughs> women's bodies are own fucking business. So that that to me is that's that's the highlight of sex positivity. The least, I mean, I'm gonna probably just say cop out. <laughs> nah, <laughs> no, view the skew, view the skew universe. View, you get, um, we'll stay in that world. Hmm, maybe mall rats. Mall rats. Yeah, I feel like I feel like. Because you know what? I don't, besides a few, I feel like everyone in there is kind of, it's probably one of his meanest cats of characters in terms of certain ways. Okay. But um, I think they're all pretty sex positive. I mean, I like, was, I even ass to mouth is, is pretty positive. When Clerks 2 came out, I was still in high school. I had not experienced any ass eating any direction. So yeah. I was like, okay, I'm learning yeah. something to take to college. <laughs> and even then, she's like, in the throes of passion, it's okay to go ass to mouth. And it's just like, yeah, yeah it takes itself back. I would have said Jay and Bob Strike Back would have been the least. You know, I... But I think it's just a lot of dumb, like, you know, gay jokes. I've never... But like, s- I actually haven't seen it by fully. By dumb, I mean not, like, dumb, like, late. I just mean, like, they're, like, they're like harmless, yeah. whatever. It's just, like, two friends making each other for being... It's it's yeah. very 2000 and late. <laughs> you exactly said that, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. F- that's what I was originally going to say, but I hadn't fully seen it because I've just seen clips, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to just preserve what I've got over uh, here, yeah. <laughs> it's, I think if you watch it in, like, part of a marathon or if you've seen all the movies, I think yeah. it's good to watch because there's so much self-referencing yeah. it's the very like metaverse you know like it's like the, the, did, the you, did you see jane bob reboot no but i have it it's it's not 
a great film, but it's a fun, it's a fun fan service movie. Uh, and so, but so Jane Bob Strike Back is a better fan service mm-hmm. movie, but also there's just a lot of, you know, that 2000 late, right. you know, I wonder if we're going to get like humor. a Jay and Silent Bob into the spider verse. Cause that would be, <laughs> cause t- <laughs> just imagine all the, var- the fun he'd have just like casting the various versions of Jay and Bob. Right. And do bring an animated reference too. Cause I did watch the entire animated clerk series. <laughs> My sister had that on DVD. So Same. I definitely had it. Yeah. Bear Drive Car. Yeah. I did. I saw the the Clerks anime series before I'd ever seen Outbreak, and like the second episode is literally just a big outbreak, mm-hmm. whatever. And is- I'm the, I don't understand any of the jokes mm-hmm. referencing Outbreak. I'm just appreciating it as an isolated episode, having no. I didn't see Outbreak until 2020. Wow. I really didn't understand what he was talking about. I don't know if I remember correctly, but isn't there like also a um a shout out to like the the critic that that, that show as well, or maybe I'm confusing it with something else. There might be. But I I my sister because my sister is um she's Gen X, so okay. she had it on DVD, and I was like, "There's a Clerks animated show," and she's like, "Yeah, here it is." And yeah, I was like, "They canceled it after two episodes." I know. But I watched it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Jane Bob is that, but more rides I think would then be the next clearest like yeah. sex neg one. Just because there's also this element of like ownership of the chick type of yeah. a thing. It it's very, ends with a dating very, show. It's very like beating chesty kind of thing. It's, it's like I will get the chick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Mm-hmm. Well, I am glad to hear that you actually also like Kevin Smith. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I see the movie in theaters, I will be keep that in mind. <laughs> I'll be like, instead of be like. Oh, Fuck, she's gonna say again. I'm like, oh, that's princess. Yeah, great. She's not 27. She just. I think I might also. I think when I filmed it, I was probably 27. So that's probably also why you're like this this Gen Z girl. It's just more like they they talk so in such an absolute way that I go like, yeah. There's no like acknowledgement that you may not know some things about the world yet right and that's not a fault of you it's just that's what happens when you're 20 you don't yeah. know much yet yeah you just know more than the high schoolers yeah and it's all media that's literacy okay. thing like that we're dealing with as well and like the puritines that's a whole part of it as well but you know what i don't let other people ruin good movies for me ah. god bless well uh princess one more time where can people go to find you follow you Bend the knee. Bend the your knee. Your highness. That's right. First or second of her name. Um, you can find me on <laughs> Oh right, grandmother. grandmother, yeah. You can find me on X um under Weeks Princess. I'm also on TikTok under Princess Pendulum. And then you can find me on YouTube where I do videos about uh monster romance and cophead and I guess next will be Bridgerton and the I'm also doing a thing about the the term tall, dark, and handsome and like the kind of like racial ambiguity of that term. So uh, good times to be had. And because all the people listening to this are listening to it on Patreon, I mean, you have a Patreon. I do have a this. Patreon. You have all these like fun fan wa- movie watch stuff on uh, or uh, TV stuff. Yeah. Uh, watch parties on Discord. So, you know, a lot of people here on Discord, you might enjoy. Go over there, throw her some money, join the parties. Absolutely. And at the dollar tier, you get to do the watch parties every month and we have a good time and we do a book club. We did The Witcher for our first one. We did uh, Yellow Face by um, RF Kwan. And right now we're reading the the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemison. So, yeah, we have a good time. Fantastic. Well, uh, Princess, I'm glad you uh, thanks again for coming by. I'm glad you figured out uh, how to be comfortable on this couch. And yes. <laughs> she is pro- in the process of recording, propped herself up on like the arm of it. And, uh, you know, why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody one more time. Bye. You know, a great way you can help the podcast is to leave it five stars. Yes, five, not four. Unless it's uh, like out of six, then do six. Do whatever the most stars legally you are allowed to put down on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are enjoying this show. If you have an extra 25 seconds, leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, for example. Mona QM writes, such a good podcast. I love getting to peer in on Billy's conversations. Super informative as well. Best questions. And M. Nunez writes, don't be fooled by the title. Billy always gives a good interview and podcast. Patreon.com slash Podcast is the best way to support the pod. Membership begins at just $3 a month and you get ad-free episodes. You don't have to hear all that commercial bullshit. You can get straight to the content without tapping fast forward. Or at least after you're done fast forwarding through the intro if you're one of those people. 
Patreon.com slash Manhorde Podcast. If you have an iPhone, uh, join on desktop or browser to avoid a big fee. Anything and everything you could need is in the notes. Uh, and the next, the next, oh, oh my God. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, that doesn't feel good. Oh my, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't feel good at all. Oh, my, be- my belly just, fe- my belly just feels hot. Movie night. I fooled you. I fooled you. We're doing hot movie night next Tuesday, September 17th. We're going to watch the Rocky one, uh, Italian Stallion, other- otherwise known as uh, uh, the party at Kitty and Studs. Only Patreon members get an invite to keep in theme with today's episode. Next week, you will hear a, uh, a solo. Ooh, scary. A solo episode of Billy. <laughs> That's me. I'm Billy. I'm still Billy. Uh, we're going to do a little Kevin Smith sex ed. Everything I have learned about sex, dating, relationships, gender, and love from the Kevin Smith Viewers universe. Wish me luck and stay slutty. Stay slutty.